everybody. You're all very welcome here today. So my name is Louise Bulger and I'm the National Research Programmes Officer with the RSU. So I'm delighted to welcome you all here today to uh, Research Day 2016. Um, the theme of today's um, Research Day is Connect, Innovate and Inspire. So I hope you'd all take an opportunity today to connect with some of the lovely research we have on display here today. Um, there are various elements to today. So we have an oral competition, we, we have a three minute thesis, we have a poster competition and an image competition. Um, please note that as part of the poster competition and image competition, you the delegates will be the ones voting for your favourite image and poster. Um, so please don't forget to vote. The ballot boxes are outside in the atrium, the lovely shiny red ones, so you can't miss them. There's also um, the voting slips will be in your pack, so they'll be in the back of the abstracts, the book of abstracts that you've all been given. So please don't lose those or forget to fill them out. Uh, we also have a WIT uh, Research Day competition on Twitter. Um, so if you could use the hashtag WIT Research Day to tweet. Um, if you also could follow us on, re on Twitter, that'd be great. We have our um, at WIT Research um, handle. So please don't forget to uh, follow us. We do tweet quite frequently about different funding opportunities and events that you can avail of. So that would be a good idea for you. Um, there is a 40 euro voucher for the Hot House Bistro um, to avail of today. So we'll be randomly selecting um, from those who tweet a winner. So please don't forget to tweet. And I hope you all enjoy the day. Before we start, I would like to ask you to uh, take note of your nearest fire exits and also to turn off your mobile phones and any electronic devices. So before we start, we have a video which um, the RSU has prepared for us. So um, please sit back and enjoy the video. So if I could invite uh, Willie Donnelly to the stage, the Professor of the Institute, please. Uh, President of the Institute, sorry. Thanks a million. Okay. <laughs> God, such happy memories. Rita, are you controlling this? Where's Rita? Who's the controller this time? <laughs> Philomena. Philomena, we'll see, we'll, we'll see uh, how it goes uh, this year. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. That makes me immensely proud when I see that. That's a fantastic video. And I just want to give everybody a round of applause because that's... <laughs> because that's, that's about you guys. That's about what you've achieved. And 
you know, research is such an integral part of us, our culture, of what we stand for, and it's about communities, it's about coming together, it's about knowledge, it's about cr creating relationships, it's about connections. Everything it stands for is what the Institute stands for. And I suppose, um, for me, research days is one of the most important days on the calendar because it's about celebrating that, it's about celebrating you, it's about celebrating uh, our students, our supervisors. And, you know, when I was outside and I walk around and I see the fantastic posters and the work that's that's been done, it's really, um, I say honestly, and I, I, I don't really have any words for it, but for me as the president of the Institute, it's what powers and energizes me and you know it, it's really I suppose when I sit up in the room <laughs> that I was saying to somebody that big room over there on the edge of the, of, of, of the Institute it's it's this things like this that energizes me and um, drives myself and I know the the executive to um, continually develop the Institute continually push the Institute forward so um, today is a very important day as I say, it's a it's a it's a day of connect, in, in, innovate, and inspire. Um, it's really your day. It's 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 a day for yourselves. So while we do have competitions, and I love the idea of the competitions, and I am adjudicating in uh, the one minute thesis, which is um, should be interesting. Uh, and the best of luck to everybody there. I just really want to say, really that to enjoy the day. I won't be here for the whole day, um, but I will try to get in and out throughout the day. And you know, what I, what's important about this, and I, I know um, in the beginning, when Susie and the girls got together and they um, talked about a research day, and by the way, I know how much effort you put into this, and, and you, you, they're tweeting, the 40 euros. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, the, the thing that was most central to it was about bringing the community together. And we, we take it for granted, I suppose, in some way in the Institute that if you're from humanities and if you're from science or if you're from health science or um, business or whatever, that you get up and present your work to everybody else. But that's not the norm. That doesn't happen in the universities, you know. Uh, there are silos, and this is a way of us breaking down that silos and getting an appreciation for what we all do collectively. And I would say that uh, going forward, the opportunity for multidisciplinarity, the opportunity for cross-fertilization in ideas and for people working together, that's where our future is. And that's where the future, actually, of society is. And we have a unique opportunity as an institute because we are internally connected, because we do share this space. We have a unique opportunity to create a new form of research, to drive that interdisciplinary. So in the first instance, it's about excellence. It's about excellence in your area. But in the second instance, it's about coming together and looking for opportunities to work and share our, our knowledge and uh, to develop new areas of opportunity. And I particularly want to welcome the new researchers that are here, all researchers actually, but particularly the new researchers because I, I hope that the researchers who have been here for a while will see that there is a community here and I met with the research forum and to me this is a very important development and I'm very supportive of the research forum because I was saying when I was sitting down there I did, I did my PhD in particle physics, which was a rather popular area in Ireland, i.e. I was the only student. And uh, I had one advantage. Um, I was in UCD. I had my own room. And I used to smoke a pipe at the time. That was before, <laughs> that was before um, the ban on smoking. And uh, so I could puff away to my heart's content in my little room, you know. Uh, but 
the problem was that it, it was a very lonely place to be because who do you talk to? Like, um, I, do, I do admit, and another change in the thing, I, I, I do actually admit I met with my supervisor three times in four years, right? And that's changed as well, uh, hopefully. But the, the, it's, you know, what we have here is a community. And uh, as I say, to, to be part of that community, and I said this last year, and I will always say to a new uh, academic researcher, this isn't like undergraduate. It's not like you can lay out a particular path that you're going to do so much every day and you're going to accumulate your knowledge and you're going to get the end of a path. It's actually more like a maze where you go around the maze, but you eventually, through the accumulation of knowledge and understanding of that knowledge, you understand where the exit it is. And, but the most important thing in the maze is the relationships and the people you meet. So I want to say to uh, all researchers that use the community, leverage the community, and feel part of that community because we're here to support you and sustain you, and no better group than the research support office. So I'm going to leave it at that. I was just testing. It hasn't gone off. I was going to keep talking until it did. But uh, I will leave it at that, and I'll see you again uh, in, in the afternoon, OK? OK, thanks, Willie. Um, so could I invite Peter to the stage now, please? Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Amelia. I'm transfixed by the image of Willie smoking a pipe, and I can, I, I can, I can just see him over in the big president's office with the fireplace over there and the feet up. So. Um, uh, it's a good vision to start the day. First of all, I'd just like to say I'm absolutely, tr truly delighted as the Head of Research Innovation Graduate Studies to introduce Research Day 2016. The earlier stages of Research Day here in the Institute, uh, there was not as many, obviously, as there is today. Today, we have uh, nearly 200 people registered. We have uh, 80 research students presenting their, uh, their research, and this is only Research Day, uh, as I said, 2000, uh, our sixth. And we have six uh, schools represented, 18 presentations, nine three-minute pieces competitions, 57 posters outside, and if all of that wasn't uh, enough, we also have uh, the image competition as well. What I want to try and do in less than 10 minutes is give you a very, very brief overview of some of the successes of in, in terms of research in the Institute in the last uh, year, and also maybe point to some of the new uh, developments that, were, so that have been, uh, the, the Institute has been successful in achieving um, into the future. The three areas I'm going to look at and give you a quick update on are uh, the research domain from last year. You have seen some of the successes uh, on the opening video. Uh, I'm very, very keen as well. A lot of researchers, uh, PhD students, and even uh, more well-established postdocs and, and, and uh, lecturing staff in the Institute may not be aware of some of the resources that we have available uh, to you if you want to bring your, your ideas further to, towards uh, the development of, say, startup companies or uh, licensing and the various supports that we have in that domain. And one of the areas that we're very, very keen to support, obviously, is the whole area of human resources that, uh, for researchers both uh, postgraduate and postdoc researchers. So what we're going, I'm going to do at the very end is just give you an update on where we stand with the HRS4 strategy for researchers as well. A lot of these figures would have been flashed up on the screen. Uh, I'm only going to concentrate on the human aspect of it and the, the impact research has had in the organisation. Last year, or 14, 15, we were looking at almost 15 million in research funding. But that bland figure, I think, doesn't uh, show the real impact. If you look at the number of, of people that that influences in the organisation and in the South East, you will see that we have 180 staff uh, members funded by research projects, 155 as of the end of, our, of uh, 2015, 155 funded postgraduate researchers. And we graduated last year 18 uh, research masters at level 9 and level 10. So I think the human impact of what this entire day is about and what research is all about is, is keenly demonstrated, I think, in those numbers. As I said, one of the areas that a lot of people may not be more uh, aware of is the impact beyond uh, just the, the research labs or, or, or the facilities that we have or the areas of research that people are at at level 9 and 10. If you want to bring your ideas uh, beyond that and look at the impact of innovation in, this, in uh, the southeast, well, I think a very good example is to look at our supports for 
intellectual property and tech transfer and to look at um, the, the facilities in the Arc Labs facilities in Waterford and in Kilkenny as well where we have dedicated incubation space and again look at the human uh, side of innovation and the impact that the Institute has had in this area where we have 28 companies employing 157 people within those uh, incubation spaces. And in terms of some of the key metrics in terms of knowledge transfer, we'd have nine license agreements, two spin-out companies and, and three patents in 2015 alone. Building on that success, um, what we have been able to achieve through the um, professionalism and, and, and the lead uh, given by Catherine Kiley in the research office is for the w WIT to secure um, funding for a two and a half million thousand square metre uh, extension to the existing Arc Labs facilities in Carrigonore. The nice building there in the middle is going to uh, hopefully be uh, our new uh, extended uh, Arc Labs facility and it will allow us to double our capacity to support tech transfer uh, activities in the southeast. The last of the areas I just want to, to note is that research is hugely important and it's hugely important that we try to develop our researchers in a sustainable way and to provide that support WIT is, was uh, uh, submitted an application and was awarded the HRS4 uh, designation in May 2014. In the box at the bottom there I think the most important aspect of it to remember is that a state where the, 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 the designation itself is all about enhancing the working conditions for researchers um, across uh, Europe and at the Institute. So the HRS4 initiative is all about um, supporting researchers uh, to develop their skills, enhance their career development, as well as uh, engaging in the cutting-edge research that you're going to see uh, presented today and on the posters outside as well. The current state of play is we're uh, approaching the two-year midpoint for that HRS4 strategy and we'll be t holding some briefing se sessions in the coming weeks with all staff as well to elicit your responses to that and for, to help us to develop <coughs> the updated plan for the next two years as well. There are two resources that I want to draw your attention to, or two elements to the HRS4. The first is the Researcher Staff Forum. Please get involved. The, the idea of developing your research career is in your own hands. And please, uh, I, I would ask you to get involved uh, with both the Researcher Staff Forum, the Postgraduate Forum as well. And we have subscribed to uh, resources such as Vitae, which helps you to plan uh, your training, plan uh, your career in research, and that uh, facility and resources available to all researchers in WIT. There's a few people I, I, I really have to thank for organising today. As you can see, the level of professionalism that goes into organising of this, of this event, as I said, where you're dealing with over 80 different sets of, of presentations, over 200 people involved, and we also have uh, school children, I think, coming in from lo local schools uh, and teachers later on to look at some of the posters outside. We have people from industry coming in as well. That doesn't happen by, by accident, and I just want to t mention a few, uh, or to give a few thanks to a few uh, people before we even start the day. I know we'll be finishing with it, but I think it's important at the outset. First of all, to all the postgraduates uh, that are here, I want to t say thanks for either uh, agreeing to or being coerced into giving your presentations and to developing your posts today. We wouldn't have that uh, without your hard work and commitment, so I'd like to thank you for that in the first instance. To the, to, to the sometimes hard-pressed uh, supervisors as well, I'd really truly like to acknowledge the huge commitment and, and, and work that goes into to supporting research in the institution and I want to, to, to thank you very, very much uh, for that. Um, I'd also like to thank some of the researchers that, that we have today. We have a Professor Alan Smeton from, or Smeaton from the Irish Research Council will be here later on today. Uh, Dr Jennifer Schneider, our visit, visiting Fulbright Scholar, thanks again for getting involved in, uh, in research in WIT and Research Day and helping out. And I'd also like to uh, particularly then finally thank, before I, I shut up, all of the research staff in the RSU who have put in huge amount of hours into the organisation of today. Finally, what I would like to say is the research, research office is there to support exactly that, to support the researchers of the Institute. Postgraduates, research assistants, postdoctoral researchers, PIs, if you are interested in developing your career and if you need help in terms of research, please by all means call over to the research office because that is exactly what we're there for. And with that, I'd like to wish everybody the very best of luck today. Uh, again, thank you for all for your submissions and for the work that's gone into the development of the day. And with that, I'll hand you over to Susie 
uh, to who's going to go through a few bits of organisation for the day as well. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks a million, Peter. Um, okay, so before we begin the oral presentations, I'd like to um, just give you some background to the oral presentation competition. Abstracts were invited from currently registered WIT postgraduate research students, and in conjunction with the heads of schools, um, 18 presentations were selected um, to give their presentations here today. Now, the quality of the abstracts was excellent, so all abstracts are in the book of abstracts that you have there today, and it was very hard to you know, limit it down to only 18 students here today. Um, our evaluation the presentation panel comprises um, Dr. Peter McLaughlin, who is our VP of Research, Innovation and Graduate Studies, who you've just met. Dr. Brendan Jennings is our Head of Graduate Studies here at the Institute. Um, Dr. Felicity Kelleher in the School of Business and Dr. Neave Maguire in the School of Humanities. So before I call the first um, school and speakers, I'd just like to remind all presenters here today that you were allocated seven minutes in which to give your presentation. And that will be timed here by our lovely timer. Um, when it goes to six minutes into your presentation, it will go amber and then um, at the very end of your presentation it will go red and please respect the, the red light because we have a lot to get through today. Um, so if you could keep an eye on the traffic light system and then you'll, that'll be followed by a Q&A session. So the head of school will monitor the Q&A session and invite questions from the audience. There are two roving mics here today so if you could please wait until the roving mic is brought to you and then you can ask a question. Um, the first presentations are from the School of Health Sciences and I'd like to invite Professor John Wells, Head of School of Health Sciences and his presenters to the stage. So if the presenters could actually sit at the top here and John then if you could introduce each of the presenters um, individually and then manage the Q&A session for them. Okay, thanks a million. Uh, well, thank you for the welcome. I'm delighted to be here with some of our fine postgraduates, as you can see, seated up on the platform. And uh, this year is actually a very special year for the School of Health Science. It's been 10 years since the School of Health Science was actually founded. And 10 years uh, provides a, a natural point of reflection on uh, the progress of the School of Health Sciences since its foundation. So... Uh, in that line, in, in, in relation to research, uh, I thought I'd give you a few interesting figures around the School of Health Science. So in the first five years of the existence of the school, the school raised in that five years just under two million euros in research funding. Uh, in the last five years, the school has more than trebled that. And in the last five years, the school has actually raised seven million euros in relation to research funding, a considerable increase in terms of both our success, uh, in terms of winning gra uh, grants, but also our success in terms of the expertise that's increasingly uh, being concentrated in terms of the School of Health Science in relation uh, to critical mass of expert research. Also, within the school now, uh, it, it is a completely doctoral led school in terms of providing doctoral education, uh, with over 50% of staff now qualified at doctoral level. In addition to that, uh, being a research-informed environment, we actually now see that being reflected in terms of some of the successes at undergraduate level in relation to the school. So, for example, uh, last year, uh, a graduate from the School in Nursing, won the Undergraduate of the Year, Year Award that's uh, uh, run by uh, Google and other companies uh, in Ireland. It's an international competition where students have to compete against other students, both from within Ireland and increasingly external to the state. And uh, this year, just literally in the last couple of weeks, we've had one uh, member, uh, one undergraduate win uh, a national prize in relation to innovation and entrepreneurship in relation to the development of a app relating to GP appointments. And a second uh, uh, undergraduate has just gone forward uh, in a national competition in relation to entrepreneurship uh, and innovation. 
In addition to that, since September, seven undergraduates have had uh, papers published in international peer-reviewed journals, and those, those seven are from years two and three of their respective undergraduate programs. So again, considerable uh, cons success. Currently within the school, there are 30 uh, people registered for uh, full-time master's level nine and level 10 uh, programs. And uh, we see further expansion of that into the future through the establishment this year of the Nutrition Research Centre Ireland, a significant development, I think, in terms of the institute as a whole, uh, being both multidisciplinary in terms of membership uh, and building on the success of such groups as the Macular Pigment Research Group. Indeed, uh, the BBC will be running a half an hour documentary on the work done in uh, the uh, centre uh, in the next couple of months. They're due to come and film, I think, uh, next month, I think is when they're due to come and film. So considerable success on the research front in terms of the School of Health Sciences. That's notwithstanding the fact that, of course, we live in a more challenging environment in terms of winning competitive funding, and we're very conscious of that. And in that context, one of the reasons why we decided to set up the Nutrition Research Centre was to establish a more multidisciplinary aspect to uh, the research profile of the school to enhance our ability uh, to win grants because multidisciplinarity is now increasingly emphasised in such programmes as Horizon 2020. So today, both in terms of the speakers on the platform, uh, the, is it one or three minute pitches? I can't remember. Uh, seven, minutes. seven minutes, my gosh, that's inflation for you. And, um, and the posters, uh, you'll see the range of research that's currently uh, being carried out within the school, both in terms of nutrition, telehealth, uh, mental illness, uh, physical health, which we see up here today, uh, and uh, sports mechanics, as I see Mike up there in the corner, they've got to get that in. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker, who is Fionn McSweeney. And uh, Fionn is going to talk about, I have to read this Fionn because I can never remember. So Fionn is going to talk about the effect of a low carbohydrate, high fat, ketogenic diet versus a high, carbo high carbohydrate diet on endurance performance. So Fionn. Hi, you're very welcome to my presentation. My name is Phil McSweeney and I'm a researcher within Health Sciences and I'm looking at the performance implications of consuming high carbohydrate and low carbohydrate high fat ketogenic diets in endurance trained athletes. Uh, before I start out, I'll briefly outline what a high carb and what a ketogenic diet is. So a high carb diet consists of 65 to 70 percent carbohydrates with moderate fats and moderate protein. While Uh, and a low carb ketogenic diet consists of 70% fat, 25% protein, while restricting carbohydrate to less than 50 grams a day. This topic has become increasingly popular in recent years, with more and more endurance athletes turning away from traditional guidelines and adopting a low carbohydrate approach to their performance. And not only have these athletes been competitive, but they've been setting records in endurance and ultra endurance events, with Tim Olson being the most notable name. Uh, so has this trend been backed by research? And you'd have to say overwhelmingly no, with 12 pieces of research showing a performance decrease as a result of an adaptation to a low carbohydrate diet, with just two pieces of research showing a performance increase as a result of an adaptation to a low carbohydrate diet. So what is it we've been failing to look at in the research terms? And quite simply, we haven't looked at the long-term performance implications. Um, 
experts say it takes three to four months for an athlete to become fat adapted. So unless, so intervention periods range from three days to seven weeks just isn't sufficient. Similarly, carbohydrate restriction wasn't sufficient. Unless you're restricting carbohydrate to less than 50 grams a day, access to your fat cells is going to be blocked as your insulin is too high. Uh, so what we decided to do was to look at the long-term performance implications of consuming a low-carbohydrate, high-fat ketogenic diet and compare it through to a traditional high-carbohydrate diet in endurance-trained athletes. We recruited 38 males who were aged 18 to 40, endurance-trained, currently consumed a carbohydrate-based diet, had two years training experience and currently completed seven plus hours a week training. Following initial screening, participants arrived for pre-intervention testing. They were fasted from the night before and received a blood sample and a DEXA scan first thing in the morning. A DEXA scan is similar to an X-ray and it gives us an estimation of their body fat, bone density and muscle mass. Following breakfast, participants arrived back in the afternoon and completed a warm-up, a six second sprint, a 100k time trial and a critical power test. Following on from this, participants are broken up into the high carb and the low carb, high fat ketogenic group. So participants in the high carb group didn't have a huge dietary intervention. It was just a matter of slightly reducing their fat or protein and increasing their carbohydrate to an optimum level. For participants going into the ketogenic group, they adopted a diet consisting of 70% fat, 25% protein, while restricting carbohydrate to less than 50 grams a day. Both groups received the same training intervention, which consisted of endurance training, strength training, and high intensity interval training. The goal of this training intervention was to stimulate mitochondrial biogenesis in the muscle. In English, that means the more mitochondria you have, the more efficiently you can convert fat to ATP, which is energy. In week 12, participants arrived back for post-intervention testing. The exercise protocol was the exact same. There was just a slight difference to the fueling strategies. So in the morning time, participants in the high carb group consumed a high carbohydrate breakfast and participants in the ketogenic group consumed a high fat breakfast. During the exercise trial, participants in the high carb group were allowed to consume 30 to 60 grams an hour of carbohydrate, while participants in the ketogenic group were only allowed to consume water and electrolytes. Firstly, I'd like to touch on the dietary results. So at baseline, there was no significant difference in either group's energy consumption. Following the 12 week dietary intervention, Carbohydrate consumption in the ketogenic group significantly decreased when compared to the high carbohydrate group. This was mirrored by a significant increase in their fat consumption when compared to the high carbohydrate group. At baseline, there was no significant difference in either group's body height or body weight. Following the 12 week dietary and training intervention, there was a significant reduction in body weight in the ketogenic group. So, what is it they were after losing? At baseline, there was no significant difference in either group's body fat percentage. Following the 12-week dietary and training intervention, body fat significantly decreased in the ketogenic group. To put this change in body fat in perspective, here's one participant 21 days into his 12-week intervention. So significant reductions there. As I mentioned earlier, during post-intervention testing, athletes in the ketogenic group were only allowed to consume water and electrolytes. So what is it they were utilizing for energy? In week one, when they arrived, their RER was 0.85 or in excess, which means that they were burning 50 to 60% carbohydrates at any given time. When they returned in week 12, their RER went below the 0.79 threshold, which means that they were oxidizing their own body fat for energy. This allowed them to complete the endurance trial without the need for external source of energy. At baseline, there was no significant difference in either group's VO2 max. Following the 12-week dietary and training intervention, both groups' VO2 max significantly increased, which was obviously great to see. Then on to the, our main measure of performance, the 100k time trial. So at baseline, there was no significant difference in either group's time trial time performance, nor was there a change to the high carbohydrate group's time trial time performance following the 12 week intervention. However, there was a significant increase in the ketogenic group's time trial time performance when compared to the high carbohydrate group. Similarly, there was a significant increase in the ketogenic group's uh, peak power, critical power. This was the three minute test done directly at the end of the 100K time trial. <laughs> Conclusions, a ketogenic diet significantly reduced fat mass and body weight when compared to the carbohydrate group. Uh, the ketogenic group's ability to oxidize fat significantly increased and VO2 max increased significantly in both groups as a result of the 12-week dietary and training intervention. 
and 100K time trial and critical power, peak power, favoured the consumption of a ketogenic diet. Uh, before I finish up, I'd just like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Lorna Doyle, and Bruce Wardrop for all of his assistance. Okay, do we have any questions? Why do I feel so short all of a sudden? Thank you very much for your presentation. Can I ask you how you recruited this, the 15 participants? Uh, be, mainly through social media. So I got Cycling Ireland, Triathlon Ireland, and Irish Triathlon. I also got Satanta College to put up posts via social media. And then participants would have emailed me. Um, and then I would have sent them a small screening form. And if they got through that initial stage, I would have f phoned them and assessed their suitability <coughs> to the trial. And their endurance sports, they were the same sports or were they different uh, sports? They ranged from cycling, uh, marathon running, uh, triathlons and Ironman. So a good, good mix. Head of research. Thanks very much indeed for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of how do you differentiate between the diet impacting mm. or the actual training regime if it was significantly different to what they were used to doing in terms of the impact? In what? You were looking at the, the impact on uh, the various, say, say, power, yeah. if you like. Um, could that have been a, a, as a result of the, the training regime that which was different? Or you know, how did you differentiate, differentiate between that effect and the actual diet being the, the impactor? Um, I think the main reason their endurance performance increased is they approached the race a lot more intelligently than the carbohydrate guys in week 12. Okay. Uh, that was purely because they had a the time they had to beat in their head. I didn't tell them what yeah. time to get. It was, it was, it was in their own head. Yeah. But guys in the high carbohydrate group, I found, went out too quick at the start. Yeah. And then for the last 40K, their RER was quite low, which to me uh, means that they're, they were running out of energy. Whether it's the ketogenic guy, guys kind of went out with a pace they could maintain and then upped it for the last 5 to 10k. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Fionn. Thanks, John. Okay, I'd now like to introduce you uh, Heather Jennings, and Heather will be talking about a satisfaction survey of parents using a dedicated developmental dysplasia of the hip clinic. Thanks, John. Uh, I'd very quickly just like to thank uh, my supervisors, L Linda Sheehan and Martina Gooney, and also Mr. Joe Byrne in University Hospital Waterford for their generous support and time throughout my project. So the background to the condition, developmental dysplasia of the hip is the preferred term. Traditionally, it would have been known as congenital dislocation of the hip, uh, but since clinical hip screening began in the 1950s, we now uh, re really recognise that it can not only be just a congenital condition, something that a child is born with, but sometimes it can be a condition that a baby can develop after birth with growth and altered development of the hip. But that being said, it is one of the most common congenital defects in newborns. It's a serious condition, and if it's left untreated or undiagnosed, it can lead to the need for major um, open hip surgery in young infants. Um, the disorder encompasses a range of anatomic abnormalities in which the femoral head and the acetabular bony roof are aligned improperly or may mature abnormally. It's a common problem in Ireland, although we don't know the exact uh, overall instance of it yet. Um, clinicians <clears throat> tend to be overcautious when they're treating this condition because, as I mentioned, it can lead to hip surgery in young children, but it can also be accounted for 9% of hip replacements in the under 40s. Currently, there are no definitive national guidelines or algorithms in relation to the screening and management of the condition. Uh, there was a review done of the neonatal and paediatric services in, in 2013 by the HSE and the Royal College of Physicians, amongst others. And what they suggested is that we have a national uptake of a published um, algorithm for DDH, which was published by the uh, Neonatal Clinical Programme in Ireland. That hasn't happened yet, but what that um, is recommending is that all at-risk infants are offered uh, ultrasound screening in the first few weeks of life. Um, it's not happening. So as a result, what is happening around the country is very ad hoc. Uh, nine out of the 19 units around the country have access to ultrasound hip te 
technology and expertise for infants. The other 10 are having to rely on a hip x-ray at about five or six months of age. So what that means is those infants are, are missing out on a, on a massive window of opportunity to treat the condition early, and that is the key. Early intervention seems to be the key to treat this uh, condition successfully. So in 2002, a dedicated DDH clinic was established in the southeast. Um, it is run by a small cohort of skilled uh, clinicians and nurses. It deals with the non-operative treatment of DDH, so what we're aiming to provide is treatment without the need for open surgery later on. Unfortunately, some children do need to be referred for, treat for procedures, and that they would be referred to either Temple Street or Crumlin. Um, treatment depends on the age of the infant and also the degree of instability. Uh, the treatment of choice does seem to be the pavlic harness uh, due to its effectiveness really. It has a 90 to 95% success rate. That can be applied straight away after birth and treatment is generally for three to four months. Uh, for the older infant, that's an infant that might be five or six months that might be diagnosed at that point, a Boston brace is... is um, is a better um, option there and again that treatment can last for sometimes five to six months. All infants are closely monitored for several months in and out of ab abduction harnessing and that's to make sure that the hip is in joint and remains in joint. They're followed through until they're walking and achieve a normal x-ray so they're actually going to be in the system for anything up to three to four years. Um, nursing input is really essential here, so that's parental education of the condition, the diagnosis and the prognosis. Um, emotional support and for the parents as well um, in relation to that is essential and regular supervision of the babies in the harness. You can see here uh, it's an x-ray of an infant that has a right-sided hip dysplasia. So on the left here you see a very healthy, well-developed femoral head and a very healthy, well-developed acetabular round bony roof there. Here on the left then you see a very underdeveloped um, femoral head and quite a flat underdeveloped acetabular roof as well which can lead to that joint dislocating out. So there is a huge impact on parents with the condition. I think any parent in the room can identify with the need for new parents to hear that their child is perfectly healthy when they're born. So you can imagine it's deeply upsetting and overwhelming for them to find out that their child, maybe sometimes in the first few days of life, uh, has an underlying hip condition that may need a few months of treatment and may, after all that, need surgery and indeed be in the system, in the hospital system for a number of years. So um, the condition does pose tremendous challenges on the parent um, in terms of work so they're going to be facing into weekly or fortnightly appointments for for the first several months. Uh, transportation can be a concern as well because the, the child when in harness is in a, a, a wide frog-legged position so they worry can they safely transport their baby in car seats or in the in the buggy and um, skin care is also a big issue because parents are um, very much advised as well as the nurses to watch the, the skin integrity so that the skin isn't actually breaking down underneath the harness on such a small infant and feeding can be an issue so when they're in that frog legged position mothers can worry particularly about how they're going to breastfeed their, their baby properly. So the nurses play a pivotal role in providing the education and support around all those issues for caring for a child with DDH. Additionally, what we do find is that sometimes parents can um, readjust the harness themselves because they might find they might feel that their child is uncomfortable or distressed in the harness. And if they do readjust that themselves, they are going to um, knock the hip out of joint. So the research project, two-phase study with a mixed method design. Phase one is ongoing and that's a clinical audit of referrals to the dedicated clinic and what we're hoping to see there are the actual uh, true instance rates of um, GDH in the region. And phase two is the satisfaction survey of parents attending the clinic. Data collection was between 20, December 2014 and February 2015 with a sample size of 100. Um, and the aim was to explore the experiences of parents and infants to identify their needs and to develop, hopefully, um, care packages for service improvements. Parents were given a questionnaire in relation to their experiences of the DDH clinic and how they found caring for a child with DDH. SBS 21 software package was used. 
So what we found is that females were the majority of the infants that were attending the clinic, actually 80% were female. And that is in line with previous studies that show that you're five times more likely to develop uh, hip dysplasia if, you're, if it's a female infant. Age of diagnosis, 50% of the uh, people surveyed were seen in the clinic and, and um, diagnosed within six weeks, and interestingly, 30% were more than 21 weeks, which would be considered a late diagnosis for the condition. Um, overall, um, parents demonstrated a high level of satisfaction with the, the appointment and the provision of practical information needed and um, the education regarding the importance of the harness as well and 42% were seen within 30 minutes of arriving in the clinic, 50% were seen within or just after 30 minutes. The main concerns were 73% of parents were worried about how comfortable their baby was in the harness, as well as 69% feeling uh, worrying about the hip instability had on their child's future. I know I'm over now, sorry, conclusion. Mm -hmm. So um, all in all, when we put the information together, we found that having a special clinic with direct prompt referrals um, means that at-risk infants are being seen earlier, that by utilising a small cohort of skills staff, that the effectiveness of the clinic is improved, and that the implications that we can reduce the, the morbidity of the condition. Thank you. OK, any questions? One very quick question. In terms of the when the diagnosis takes place, yes. is there a difference then in terms of the treatment strategy that's employed post that? Definitely. So the is only used up to an age, is that? Yeah. Um, early intervention is the key on this one. So the earlier that the, the diagnosis is made, we can use that most effective treatment, which is the, the Pavlik harness, <coughs> which has a 19 to 95% success rate. The later that it is diagnosed, the more chance that that child is going to need open hip surgery, which is what we're trying to avoid at all costs, really. You, uh, this is close to my own heart, but yes. uh, it's uh, hereditary, correct? It can be, yeah, yeah. yeah. And is and and that commonality in uh, girls that's common across the world, is it? It is, yeah. Uh, while there's no known direct cause or causes for it, what we do know that as some some infants are more predisposed to the condition. Why girls seem to be more predisposed is because of the hormone that's released in the late stages of pregnancy, uh, relaxing, and that that does exactly what it says. It relaxes the smooth muscle and allows passage of the infant through the birth canal. Female infants seem to be sensitive to that hormone. So their, their ligaments can relax as well. They're pr predisposing them to the, the hip dysplasia. That is what we feel, but we, we don't really know the, di the true direct causes of it. And I have a very quick technical question. What was your response rate in your survey? 100%. So you were face to face? Uh, I was in the clinic, um, yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Heather. you. Now we need to come out of this, I think, don't we? <coughs> need to change that. Yeah. Um, I'd like to introduce you now to Karen Mullins. And Karen is going to be presenting a presentation on changes in functional athletic performance measures following the arthroscopic treatment of femor femora acetabular impingement. 12-week data. Um, so good morning, uh, my name is Karen and so following on from Heather we're still dealing with the hip except my patients are a bit older. Um, my project looks at the changes in functional performance following the arthroscopic treatment of femoral acetabular impingement with my supervisors Dr Michael Hanlon and Mr Patrick Carton who is the orthopaedic surgeon in Whitfield and today we're just going to be looking at some 12 week data. So just to introduce the topic then, so femoral acetabular impingement, or FAI, is caused by the abnormal bone growth on either the pelvis here, as seen in pincer impingement, or the femoral neck head junction um, is seen in cam impingement, but in actual fact, most patients will present with a combination of the two. So if you can imagine, if you're trying to move your uh, femoral head into the joint, so any kind of emotion that involves flexion, internal rotation, anything like that, 
the extra bone is going to stop it but it's also going to tear the tissue inside in the joint so mainly the labrum and the articular cartilage if you let that go without any kind of an intervention the labrum and the cartilage will just um, degrade until you're left with bone on bone and you'll be looking at the development of arthritis then which is what we really really don't want so it's highly prevalent in young athletes and most of the surgical data or the research out there at the moment has used um, self-reported measures from patients to see how well the surgery has gone. But since this kind of population have a lot more strenuous demands on their hip, we thought that a more functional test would be more appropriate for them. So with that in mind, we recruited 18 to 35 year old males with no prior hip surgery, with no secondary lower limb injury at the time, and who were involved to, in recreational to more competitive sport, and our patients had diagnosed hip impingement by Mr. Carton in the hospital. We then went out of our way really to recruit a control group that matched our patients as closely as possible. So with regard to age, um, the sport that they played with, and the level that they played at as well. So we really wanted to isolate that one group had hip <coughs> impingement and the other didn't. That left us with 42 patients who were tested at baseline and again 12 weeks after their surgery and 32 controls who were tested at baseline and 12 weeks later with no interruption to their kind of habitual training schedules. And both groups would be tested again at one year after. So what we did then was we carried out three trials of a 10 meter sprint with 45 seconds seated recovery. We carried out three trials of a modified T-test, which was just half the version of the normal. Uh, as you can see from the video, both groups ran on a rubber track so that everyone ran on the same surface. And we used dual beam timing gates for that. We also looked at five trials of a deep squat, which is just coming up here. And we assessed that for depth using Dartfish software here in the college. We looked at reactive strength index, which is the ability of an athlete to generate force quickly using a single leg drop jump. And then we also looked at maximal hip flexion, abduction and internal rotation using a goniometer. All participants were also asked to um, note any anterior groin pain that they felt throughout any of the tests. So what we found then was at baseline, patients were significantly slower than controls on 10 meter and modified T-test, although no difference in squat depth or reactive strength index. At 12 weeks post-surgery, while they're still slower than the controls, we saw a significant within group improvement for the patient group for the T-test. So the patient group are actually getting quicker on the change of direction test as early as 12 weeks after surgery. Looking at the flexibility then, so very much the same, lower levels of flexion, abduction, internal rotation at both time points, but again, significant within group improvements in the patient group. Looking at our pain, so um, the three tests where patients reported pain were the 10 meter, the T test and the squat. So you can see uh, lower levels of patients reporting pain for all three, but especially in the squat depth. So 23 patients reporting pain before surgery and only seven after. So just to kind of to recap, so prior to surgery, decreased time over uh, short different distances, so they're not as fast. They're not able to change direction as efficiently as the healthy controls. They've decreased hip flexibility and increased levels of pain. Now why all that is important is that unlike um, a broken bone or a ruptured ACL, anything like that, this particular condition won't immediately sideline the athletes. So they're not, um, they can play up to and following diagnosis. And um, so just their coaches and training staff working with them need to know that they're gonna be kind of on the back foot compared to the other guys. If they decide to go down the surgery route, we're looking at as early as 12 weeks, increased agility, increased flexibility, and decreased pain. So these patients aren't back training. Um, they're still kind of at the um, tw end towards the end of their rehabilitation. They have a consultation at 12 weeks with Mr. Carton. He will decide then whether they can go back training or not, but we're seeing improvements on our tests at that early stage. So kind of leading on from this, we decided to look at the whole condition from a different angle and ask ourselves, what exactly are the guys doing with their hips or what are they asking their hip to do? And is it something about the game that they play? 
uh, that might be influencing the rate of this condition. So we've uh, videoed 10 intercounty hurlers throughout the league and we are using Dartfish um, to analyse exactly what they're doing and we've linked up with the guys in LIT and Thurlis to use their new biomechanics lab to try and assess the levels of flexion, extension, internal rotation through the movements that we've identified on the video. So, thanks very much. <laughs> Any questions? In terms of the level of <coughs> surgery that each of them had, was there a significant difference between that intervention group that the, or, or were all the operations fairly similar that they had? Yeah, we are going to report on that when we kind of, this isn't our full data set, um, but we do, the main objective of the surgery is to repair the tissue inside the joint. So they will always repair viable tissue and they'll remove the bone that's causing the impingement. So that's the general idea of every surgery, but obviously there's slight differences um, when you look at where the impinging bone is and yeah. the amount of it they have to remove. Okay, thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Just a question. Um, why are all your um, participants male? Um, that was a kind of a logistic thing in that we don't deal with a lot of women over in Whitfield and they're... <coughs> Um, not as good to come back for their follow-ups. That's the only <laughs> reason. <laughs> yeah. And that uh, women tend to be a little bit older uh, when this condition kind of in their 40s and stuff. So we wanted to really target the athletes. athletes. Okay. One more. Yeah. Ema. Uh, how, did you com how did you recruit the comparator group? The control group? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I just went to clubs and uh, managers and um, asked them to use their team. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing that um, <laughs> because I thought I was great. I was getting 30 lads in in one go. I said, this is brilliant. And then what happened was I lost the manager's support. So then I lost the group of 30 in one go. So that there we, start, we have about 70 controls, but just the follow-ups, they're really, really bad. So if anyone there don't recruit your controls as a group. Try and get them individually, I'd say. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. That concludes the presentations to the School of Health Science. Thanks a million, John. Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay, so we're going to change up the pace a little bit now. Our next session is the one-minute poster pitches from STEM. Um, each research postgraduate student who has a poster on display outside now has the opportunity to come up here and pitch their poster to you in one minute flat. So for those of you who are doing the pitch, I am the light will go amber when you have 10 seconds left and then will turn red when your time is up. Um, hopefully this will encourage people in the audience to actually go outside and have a look at the students' posters and maybe they might be able to twist your arm to actually vote for their poster to win the poster competition because we all have an opportunity here today to, um, as a delegate's choice, to choose a winning poster. Um, there's also a panel going around for both STEM and AHSS. So um, our first student is Alex Donohue. And what I'll do is I'll change the name and if your name comes up, if you want to come up and actually um, pitch your poster. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so, morning everyone. Um, so, okay, we've heard of health promotion in settings such as schools, workplaces, communities, hospitals, even prisons. So, why not in a sports club? So, promoting health, um, in a, sorry, using the largest sports club in Ireland, the GA, as a vehicle to promote health, gives us access to parents, children, adolescents, adult players, coaches, mentors, and of course the community that they're connected with. So then what benefit will this have to the GA club itself? So from our research, we found that promoting health through the GA club also benefits the club in that it increases the club membership, it improves perceptions of the club, um, and it, it improves community engagement with that club. And 100% um, of our 
um, clubs replied that their club was better as a result of being involved in the Healthy Club project and that their club culture had improved. So as well as having greater access to promote health through the community, it also benefits clubs themselves. So. Hello everyone, I'm Amruta Deshpande. Uh, uh, healing with the medicinal plants is as old as mankind is, and uh, uh, we are here uh, investigating anti-inflammatory properties of Irish native plants based on the traditional use of those plants as anti-inflammatories. And we will be screening these for uh, uh, anti-inflammatory assays in vitro, and uh, hopefully we'll find out some uh, novel therapeutics for treating inflammatory conditions. And that's it. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Caroline Bertha, and I'm currently in my third year of uh, WIT-funded uh, PhD scholarship, studying within the Eco Innovation Research Centre. The centre is concerned currently with the um, bio various bioactivities and application of seaweed. Um, the object of the objective of um, bio discovery and bioprospecting and mining for bioactivities is the discovery of novel compounds. Um, my project deals with a specific um, bioactivity, that against MRSA. Um, I deal with a red seaweed extract, and the aim is to um, separate and isolate compounds responsible for this activity. The threat of MRSA is still there, as is from other um, superbugs. Um, to date, we have, I we have isolated and separated um, the compounds um, responsible for the anti-MRSA activity, but the challenge is to isolate enough for further identification and characterization. Thank you, and please come and look at my poster, number 31. Thank you. Good morning, uh, my name is Daniel Martins. Uh, imagine that uh, bacteria is the common living organism in the world, and uh, they could be as harmful as good to us. So what they, they have in common when they are harmful and they are good to us? They communicate, okay? So we uh, are starting to study how bacteria communicate, and how we can use that communication aspect to produce some new developments in, or in new types of biotechnology applications. Uh, most of our research are simulation based, okay? But uh, we are looking for some partners to do wet labs and try to apply our models, our methods, to try to bring this to real world. Uh, good morning. Um, so the Healthy Clubs project was set up to explore uh, GA clubs around the country as settings for health promotion. Um, so phase two has started now and there's 60 clubs involved um, from all over the country and over the next 12 to 18 months they'll be rolling out various programs and activities to promote health for their own members and for the wider community. Um, so our aims as part of the evaluation is to uh, hopefully capture some positive health behaviour changes and also assess the impact that being part of the Healthy Club has on the day-to-day -day runnings of GA clubs. Um, so the GA will then use the results of our evaluation to um, 
all Tyrann assess their model for the healthy clubs and make it fit for purpose and sustainable going forward for hopefully every club to get involved with. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, so youth mental health is a very topical subject right now and in order to support our young people to achieve their full potential we must first support the youth that work with them on the front line. To this effect my research is examining a training programme for youth workers called Facilitation Skills for Health and Wellbeing. The research aims to explore the experience of the training on the youth participants at a personal level, the diffusion of the training into their practice with young people and the extent to which any diffusion achieved is sustainable. So the participants include 16 youth workers from eight different organisations across <coughs> Ireland, eight line managers and approximately 80 colleagues. And qualitative methods are being used for data collection. So initial results are proving positive about the effect this training programme has had on participants' own well-being, and they are starting to integrate aspects into their work practice, which will hopefully continue to support them and the youths that they work with. And if you'd like to view my poster, it's number four. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the topic of my master's project is an edge computing approach for detecting lameness in dairy cattle. Uh, the dairy industry plays a significant role in the econo economy of uh, every country, and lameness is one of the most important problem. It act act actually, it has been counted as the third most important problem in the dairy industry. And we want to uh, detect the lameness in dairy cattle at an early stage so as to help the farmers uh, in avoiding their health hazard problems related to the dairy cattle and to help them achieving efficiency and profit with the help of the information and communication technology. So uh, we want to detect the lameness at an early stage so as to help the Irish farmers and the farmers all over the other parts of the country and the world. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Hi, you're all very welcome. So my project is looking at the effects of cancer-related fatigue on post-treatment cancer survivors. Cancer-related fatigue is the most debilitating side effect amongst cancer survivors. Um, lasting years into their their survival exercise there is evidence to suggest that it, it can help with fatigue however many of the studies to date have used uh, control groups with a weightless or usual care and have also uh, focused on people who did not necessarily have fatigue in the first place so what we look to do is develop a program that use exercise and then compare that to a health education group and see was it in fact the exercise that had the effect on the cancer related fatigue other than other strategies. To date, we have some good results to suggest that fatigue is significantly reduced in the exercise group over the health education group. And if you want more information, unfortunately, you're going to have to come and ask me some questions at my poster in a few minutes. <laughs> Good morning. Imagine we are a big enterprise and we have to make a conference call to our clients back in California. So we start our enterprise collaboration software and uh, start the streaming. But our internet service provider don't, don't have much control in ensuring quality of service to our stream in that there will be no latency and delay. Compare that to road travel 10 years back when we had six choices of roads. We choose one which seems to be fastest, but if there's a bottleneck or a blockade, we are struck, stuck. Roll back to now when we have Google Map kind of service where we have real-time road congestion and <coughs> breakdown inf information, which can assist, and assist us in choosing the best travel path. Uh, this research tries to create a Google Map kind of service for networks in which internet service providers can have a real-time network breakdown and congestion information so that they can use this information to provide better quality of service to our enterprise collaboration softwares. This can be made possible by making networks more software-based rather than uh, the closed black boxes they are now. Thank you. Uh, 
Next up this morning, we have the School of Humanities, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Hayes and his students to the stage, who will be next up this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Richard Hayes is my name. I'm the head of School of Humanities. I'm really delighted to be here this morning uh, to introduce these researchers. Um, but I want to start by thanking the Research Support Unit for this, for this great occasion and for all the support they give uh, to us in the school uh, in, in developing our, our research. Um, the value of today, I think, is in, in cultivating and sustaining that research environment, and I think uh, also in, in generating these new connections and new ideas, and already, I think, uh, from from even those few, few brief presentations we've heard to date, I think the ideas are are are, uh, are in circulation, and uh, that's terrific. Uh, humanities research seeks to improve the world through the study of people, uh, through the study of the people who inhabit the world, and the ways in which people move through the world. And uh, our interest, therefore, is in the individual and the individual's experience. Our interest is in understanding and promoting the well-being of communities, and our interest is in examining the wider uh, region and in nationalizing and internationalizing the outcomes of region-related research. Um, and therefore, our research in the school uh, is interested in the investigation of identity. Uh, we're driven ethically by a commitment to inclusivity. We're uh, very we recognize the connection between creativity and innovation, and therefore part of what we do is to desire innovation and new development. And I think we proceed through, amongst other things, a critical interpretation of texts and contexts. And all of these uh, will be visible, these methodologies and these emphases will be visible in the work of the four researchers who are going to present as part of this session. And I'm very pleased to, to welcome them today, and, and I want to uh, introduce the first of them, who's uh, working under the supervision of Dr. Neve McGuire. And this is Jean Ann Kennedy, who's going to speak about policy and practice in Ireland, pre-sentence reports, and the criminal justice system. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jean Ann and I am a second year PhD candidate in the School of Humanities. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Neve McGuire and Dr. Nicola Carr for their supervision so far. My research investigates the role played by pre-sentence reports in the sentencing of offenders. Judges request pre-sentence reports after conviction and before sentencing. They're prepared by probation officers in the Irish Probation Service and provide the judge with information on the personal circumstances, background and attitude of the offender, and as well as usually including sentencing recommendations. My research will explore the circumstances in which pre-sentence reports are requested by judges, con the construction of the report by the probation officers, as well as how the judges interpret and employ this information in their sentencing decision making. My data collection methods include ethnography of the court environment, observation of probation practice, content analysis of the pre-sentence pre report themselves, as well as interviews with key stakeholders, including the judge, the offender, the lawyers, and the probation officers. This paper today will focus mainly on the key purposes of pre-sentence reports, as well as the wider policy practice involved. So in Ireland, on any one day, approximately 1,600 reports are being written. And in 2014, 12,500 reports were produced by the probation services, about 80% of which were these pre-sentence reports for the court. Sentencers are the core users of the probation services. 
This is because probation has a role in pre- and post-sentence decision-making. They provide pre-sentence reports before sentencing, and if a community-based sanction or measure is imposed, they are the criminal justice agency providing the necessary supervision. It is not then surprising that the Probation of Offenders Act is the most used piece of legislation in criminal cases in the local court. If agreement of the recommendation in the pre-sentence report and the sentence imposed by the judge is a measure of good quality pre-sentence reports, it must still be acknowledged that sentencing is more complex than this simple causal relationship. That said, in Ireland in 2013, Burke conducted research into the correspondence between the sentencing recommendations of the pre-sentence report and what sanction the judge actually imposed. While it was a small sample group, it did record an 86% uptake of the sentencing recommendations. And this suggests a high confidence by the Irish judiciary in the usefulness and the content of this report. A second, perhaps implicit purpose of the report may serve to assess offender suitability for community-based sentences and in such circumstances may promote the use of community-based sentences and measures. The implicit logic is that if the judge may more often choose community-based sanctions and measures if they're better informed by a credible source, such as the probation service that would then be providing that supervision. So if we think pre-sentence reports are important, then it might be logical that we want to make sure they're of good quality and consistently so. And this opens the conversation about guidelines, templates and frameworks, as well as a wider policy approach to the criminal justice system in Ireland, particularly in recent decades. When it comes to sentencing recommendations, pre-sentence reports may include both the formal explicit, uh, explicit approach of sentencing recommendations or take a more implicit, subtle approach about trying to influence sentencing. Halliday et al. and Tatat et al. identify in their research that the authors of pre-sentence reports in Scotland use a narrative construction as a way of implicitly influencing the sentence decision. England and Wales currently use stricter guidelines, which are often used to reinforce policy change or measure policy decisions. Downing and Lynch problematise the strict use of templates and guidelines as it limits the probation officer as to how they construct the report and so also its purpose and influence on sentencing. The Irish Probation Services have an internal set of guidelines and provide training to their staff. There's no formal policy influence from the government as such, and there's no external and consistent evaluation of pre-sentence reports. Over the last two decades, while there has been some review and monitoring of pre-sentence report writing, it is only as part of a general assessment of the pre-sentence services overall. The criminal justice system in Ireland is often neglected when it comes to policy and the Irish penal policy making has risen and fallen as a priority or, or a non-priority in both the public and the political imagination in the last few decades. The Department of Justice and Equality itself acknowledge that penal policy has been reactive and responsive to emerging issues rather than a planned and forward-looking strategy of making Ireland a safer place. The Whitaker Report in 1985 is a report that we still refer to because it's a comprehensive and wider look at the criminal justice system. As well as having a broad penal reform recommendation, the most important is that prison should be a sentence of last resort and that community sanctions should both be more widely available and more widely used. The persistent problem, though, is that most policy recommendations since have remained the same and any reform or positive development that has happened is often reactive and compensating for an outdated and under-resourced system. It's generally agreed that the further development of intermediate punishments, those that are considered less harsh than prison and not as lenient as probation, is a welcome thing. The issue is that this needs to be a system-wide commitment and include meaningful diversion. The Irish Penal Reform Trust in 2010 says that Ireland has one of the most punitive criminal justice systems in We have an average prison population size when compared to Europe, but we have a flow of prisoners that's incredibly high, meaning that we send more people to prison for a shorter time. The number of offenders with community-based sanctions and measures has increased significantly across Europe, and in Ireland, supervision orders in 2011 showed an increase of over 450% compared to the 1980s. 
Seven of the top, seven of the ten European countries with the highest probation rates are also among the top ten with the highest prison population. And in Ireland, for every 100 people we had in prison in 2010, we had 127 on probation. We need to make sure that penal policy reduces the numbers in prison, but doesn't inflate the numbers under supervision, when across Europe, most countries seem to be struggling with exactly this net widening. Penal moderation is a more holistic understanding of a reductionist policy addressing all penal interventions. Finally, my last sentence. Investing significantly in the probation services, given their capacity to innovate and answer to policy shift, committing wholly to community-based sanctions and measures in their own right, and not only as a solution to mass incarceration, as well as further understanding the current and potential contribution of pre-sentence reports to individualised justice, purposeful sentencing, and meaningful pu punishment un will underpin a legitimate, rights-based, fair to all and just penal system. Thank you very much. You're not off the hook yet. I know. <laughs> I have questions, ladies and gentlemen. Brendan. Uh, thank you, Jean-Anne. Um, I'm wondering of the, the pre-sentence reports you've of the pre-sentence reports you've seen so far, how similar are they? Are, you know, is there a lot of boilerplate text, or do they have some like turn it in to see how similar the reports they generate are? I'm really sorry, I can't hear. <laughs> sorry, try this again. Okay, um, of the pre-sentence reports you've seen so far, I'm wondering how similar they they are. Um, is there a lot of boilerplate phrases or text that's used, or do they? You know, is there something like turn it in that they can see how? similar the reports all are because obviously if, if they're all very similar that could be quite unfair to uh, to the people involved. Certainly there is a, a question of how individualised those would be but I invite you to ask me that next year because I'm just after getting gatekeeping and I'm about to start my direct uh, primary research which is why I focused on my literature. So I'll, ask, I'll answer that in about 12 months, is that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, just a question. Um, in terms of the international best practice, yes. um, the, the, the use of these um, pre-sentence reports, uh, has there been a review carried out saying are they used in the States, the UK, and uh, ha has a review been carried out of the effectiveness of those and, and the take-up of those by judges? So there, there's a lot more comparable research happening at the moment across criminal justice systems. And certainly the pre-sentence report, it's a legacy of a, a common law legal system, um, and certainly one that focuses on rehabilitation. But other legal systems are taking on pre-sentence reports, even though they mightn't have originally brought them in as part of their history. So there does seem to be more of a, an uptake on them, and they do seem to um, be valued um, across the world, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well done, Gina. Thank you. Thanks very much. So our, our next presenter uh, is Kirsty Doyle. Uh, Kirsty is working with Dr. John O'Brien, and Kirsty is going to talk about an ethnography of the district court exploring how alcohol-related public order offences are sentenced in Ireland. So, Kirsty Doyle. Okay, so um, my name is Kirsty Doyle and I'm in the third year of my PhD. Um, my research is exploring um, how alcohol related behaviour is defined and regulated within the nighttime economy and the consequences, both legal and non legal, of that behaviour. Um, today, I'm going to focus on how this behaviour, uh, I'm going to focus on the legal consequences of this behaviour by exploring how alcohol related public order offences are sentenced in the district court. Okay, so the objectives of the research are to understand the circumstances in which a conviction is or is not recorded, the types of sentences typically imposed for these offences, the characteristics of defendants charged with such offences and the impact, if any, the nighttime economy has on the sentencing decisions. So 
The importance of the research, um, there's a number of reasons why this research is important. The first of which is that um, the Public Order Offence Group um, had the second largest um, committal to prison for the year 2014. This means that a significant proportion of people are getting custodial sentences for minor offences. Um, Hamilton argues that this calls into question whether judges actually adhere to the principle of detention as last resort. In addition, the research is important um, because the attitude of the courts has um, two public order offences and the sentencing of these offences um, has shown to influence the guards in whether or not they record these offences. Lastly, the research is important because no research um, that I'm aware of ha has actually looked at whether the nighttime economy does influence these offences, uh, the sentencing of these offences. Okay, so in order to um, address these issues then, I conducted an analysis of court reports for the past 10 years and also conducted ethnography in the district court. So this chart um, shows some of the analysis of the court reports. Um, basically, it it highlights the percentage of public order and assault offences disposed of in the district court between the years 2005 and 2014. Um, what is important to take from this chart is that public order offences, public order and assault offences are a significant proportion of the offences coming before the court. So this slide then details the how these offences were actually sentenced for these years. So the most popular um, sentences were taken into consideration um, when being convicted of a more serious offence, a strikeout and a fine. Um, however, although these seem to be quite lenient, it is important to remember that 10% do actually result in a custodial sentence. Um, so while the co court reports do offer a good overview of how these types of um, offences are sentenced, there are a number of limitations. So the first is that the, um, the data for public order offences does also include assault offences, which aren't actually public order offences. Um, secondly, there are no characteristics provide, provided of the types of defendants who are actually being convicted of these offences. And thirdly, it is unsure what particular public order offences are getting what sentences. So in order to complement the court report data then, I conducted ethnography in the district court. Um, so contrary to the court reports then, I actually observed very few public order offences during my observations. So over six days of observation, I only um, observed six cases which were alcohol-related public order offences. So these were eight public order offences as three offences related to the one case. Um, by far the most popular offence was Section 4, Intoxication in a Public Place. And this, the sentencing of this offence was dependent on whether or not the defendant had previous convictions. From my observations as well then, I observed that the judge practised um, a rules of thumb approach to sentencing. This means that in the absence of sentencing guidelines in Ireland, the judge develops his own penalties for particular offences. Um, in terms of the characteristics then of the types of people who were being convicted of these offences, all the cases I observed were male. There were two in their 20s, three in their 30s, and one in his 40s. Um, the employment situation was only outlined in two cases, which really just shows the brevity of information that's actually observed when you do sit in the court. So, the role of the nighttime economy um, didn't seem to impact on the sentencing of these offences at all. As I previously mentioned, it was dependent on whether or not the defendant had any previous convictions or not. However, the context of the nighttime economy um, may influence how these offences are policed. 
For example, the defendants who committed offences during the day were arrested and summoned to court, yet the defendant who committed offence in the nighttime economy was first given a fixed charge notice. It was only when this was failed to be paid that he was actually summoned to court. So to conclude then, um, contrary to the court reports, the study observed very few alcohol-related offences come before the court. Um, this may indicate that there are local variations in how, um, in, with regard to the policing of these offences, and that Garda in the jurisdiction where this study was conducted um, practice alternative ways of dealing with these alcohol-related behaviour, such as fixed charge notices. So as I go forward, I plan to do an analysis of the fixed charge notice to find out more about this. Um, lastly, then, in terms of the sentencing, the judge seemed to have adopted a rules of thumb approach to sentencing. The main factor in determining the sentence was whether or not the defendant had previous convictions. Um, however, I do acknowledge that there is this is a very small uh, sample, so I do intend to do more ethnography and also solicitors who deal with these cases more regularly. Thank you. Is there an easier way to carry out research in terms of just looking at, um, say, reports of uh, the type of offences, how many offences come into court? Is there a, an easier way of rather than you having to sit through the court, the court cases yourself? Um, the problem with the court report data is I'm looking, I want to look at sp specifically alcohol-related public order offences. This um, presentation is part of a, a wider kind of research question that I'm looking at, and unfortunately the available data isn't there. So as I said, the, the um, public order offence data is mixed in with assault offences, which are um, offences against the Person Act and are generally considered more serious than public order offences. And also, um, little is, I I'm kind of interested in, in whether there's an acceptability around drinking in the nighttime economy and whether these are less inc are seen to be more acceptable than being drunk in falling down the street during the day. So. Thanks very much. No. Great, thank you. Could I, could I just ask you, Kirsten, yeah. could, you, could you define for us the nighttime economy? What is, what is the nighttime economy? Yeah, sorry about the brevity. Um, it's just seven minutes, it's very short. <laughs> but yeah, the nighttime economy um, is characterised as a then social space, it, it generally in urban centres, that it has a high concentration of bars, nightclubs, and fast food restaurants. Yeah. So, like if you think Temple Bar or something like that. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> Great, well done. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Um, our next presenter is uh, Deirdre Atkins. Deirdre is going to talk about the legal rights awareness and perceptions of legitimacy, implications for Irish prisoners and criminal justice stakeholders. And uh, Deirdre is working with uh, Drs Geraldine Clear and Eve Maguire. Um, good morning. Um, as Richard said, my name is Deirdre and I am currently in the second year of my PhD. So today I want to talk to you about some findings from my literature review. I'm about to begin the data collection process, so I just, I, I can't discuss those just yet with you. So today I'm going to outline some of the main concepts from my research. Um, and I'm going to discuss the implications then the research might have for prisoners and criminal justice stakeholders. So finally, if I have time, I will discuss the methods I'm using to um, measure and explore these issues. So according to recent statistics, over half of all prisoners released from prison re-offend within three years. This raises serious questions surrounding the effect of imprisonment. So why do so many ex-prisoners re-offend? How can the rate of re-offending be reduced? And does prison work? So today, I'm going to discuss two factors which might actually contribute to reducing reoffending. The first is legal rights awareness among prisoners, and the second is uh, prisoners' perceptions of the legitimacy of their sentence and the prison regime. 
So, I forgot that slide, we'll skip that one. <laughs> Many Irish prisoners have poor literacy skills when they enter prison and have left school without any formal qualifications. This presents a significant barrier for prisoners whose rights may have been violated, but due to their low literacy levels and inadequate skills are restricted in their ability to recognise and communicate their legal problems. It may be fair to say then that this may also impact greatly on a prisoner's ability to navigate a complex legal system and understand legal processes which they are likely to encounter if they attempt to assert their rights in court or in prison. Legal rights awareness then is a necessary component for a person in deciding whether or not to seek a remedy to a problematic incident or experience. Essentially, legal rights are meaningless if people are not aware that they exist. So all citizens, including prisoners, have a right to access to court to challenge any alleged violations of their rights. However, it has been highlighted that prisoners are reluctant to do this. So while their reluctance may be due to fear of punishment by the prison authorities, it may also be the case that prisoners are just not aware of their rights. Prison conditions in Ireland have been routinely criticised by domestic and international bodies. So overcrowding, in-cell sanitation, access to vital services and inadequate procedures are just some of the serious issues highlighted in official reports. In 2014, the Inspector of Prisons, Judge Michael Riley, reported that there were systemic operational difficulties which could only suggest that the protection of the system was more important than the rights of the individual. So, the failure of the state to use adequate procedures and to provide basic standards of care to prisoners leaves open the possibility of legal claims against them and arguably serves to undermine the legitimacy of the prison system and the wider criminal justice system. So, positive perceptions of legitimacy are important because they promote voluntary compliance with the law. If criminal justice agents are use fair procedures and they are perceived as such, it is argued that procedural justice judgments contribute to enhanced perceptions of legitimacy. According to Tyler, there are four principles of procedural justice. These are voice, neutrality, respect, and trust. And there is evidence to suggest that if authorities incorporate these principles into their everyday policies, it will enhance the legitimacy of the institution or authority. Recent studies have highlighted the importance of fair procedures in prison. So where prisoners reported that they believed that the prison authorities were fair, there was a notable reduction in prison disorder and misconduct. Prisoners voluntarily complied with the prison rules, which in turn enhanced their perceptions of legitimacy. In addition, when prisoners were released from prison, there was a considerable reduction in the rate of reoffending. Also, uh, where prisoners had good staff prisoner relationships, um, perceptions of legitimacy were also enhanced. So these studies highlight the importance of fair and just treatment uh, of prisoners by prison authorities. And in order to promote these positive perceptions, legal authorities actually need to work with offenders. They need to collaborate with these um, individuals. So not only could this lead to a reduction in reoffending, but it could eventually result in desistance from crime. So to move on then to the implications of the, the research for prisoners and criminal justice stakeholders. By enhancing prisoners' awareness of their rights, it might encourage participation in issues affecting prisoners' own lives. It may also promote a sense of inclusion and enable prisoners to highlight adverse prison conditions in an institution which is otherwise closed off from public view. Research examining prisoners' awareness of their legal rights is vital to ensure that they can effectively engage with legal authorities and to ensure that their right to access to justice is being respected. Furthermore, the fair treatment of offenders might contribute to a reduction in disorder and misconduct in prison and reduce reoffending after release. So by incorporating these principles of fairness and, and procedural justice, uh, legal authorities could actively promote the legitimacy of the law and encourage compliance with the law. 
So I have some time. Um, I'm just going to go through briefly my methodology. I'm using a multi-method approach to examine these issues. So I'm using surveys to measure prisoners' awareness of their legal and basic rights. And I'm also using semi-structured interviews to explore prisoners' narrative experiences of their perceptions of legitimacy. So while there'll be a particular focus on legitimacy in court and in prison, um, it's also important to explore their previous experiences, so say encounters with the police, um, general encounters, education, as I've touched on in the, in the introduction, we know that there are some issues there as well. So it's, it's, it's important to capture all these experiences and to see which um, have, have impacted on them the most. Um, so hopefully next year I will be here presenting the findings of my study. And thank you. Could you clarify, what's the next step in, in the research? Now? At the moment, I am negotiating with the prison service. Um, things are at a, a kind of a little bit of a standstill at the moment, but I, I believe it's imminent. So um, I'm just I'm just waiting to get in there. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Questions, Felicity. Thank you very much for your presentation. You. I'm interested because it's a closed environment about the ethics process that you've had to pursue. Yes. So at the well. Obviously, through WIT, um, there's a lot of issues surrounding. They're very, quite vulnerable people, you know, and they're they're dependent on the state to, to provide standards of care. But also, I need to be mindful of the fact that they are um, um, quite in a vulnerable position. Um, they also may have other issues, so issues such as confidentiality, um, anonymity. When I'm I'm writing up my research. So um, I need to be very mindful of that throughout the process, but also the prison service um, ethics board, it's quite a detailed um, ethics form to be sent there. So it's kind of a, a case that it's, it's written twice. Um, so it's ingrained um, in my brain. So it's quite um, an intensive process, but I think it's necessary given their vulnerability. Thanks, Georgia. Just looking at your methodology there, you mentioned that you're going to use surveys as one of the approaches. Um, and earlier you said that these are a vulnerable group with limited education. So how will you get around that? They'll be face-to-face -face surveys. So okay. I will administer the surveys to the prisoners just in case there are any literacy issues. Yeah. Um, and to make sure that everyone can be included when I recruit my sample. So um, they're face-to-face -face and I'll relay the information to okay. the prisoners and explain Perfect. where necessary. Thanks, well done. Um, I'm just interested, you spoke about um, in, your, pri or in your, your secondary research with the perceptions of legitimacy in other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Are there any learnings there and what ju other jurisdictions did you look at in, in that context and any learnings um, that from an Irish context we can draw on? Um, so the main studies have been drawn from the UK, Slovenia and the Netherlands who um, it's only relatively recent research in correctional settings. So the majority of the research has been relating to um, police encounters and that in the courts as well. So what we can learn from the correctional um, research is that it, it, fair procedures matter. Given that um, um, there are so many issues surrounding prison conditions and treatment and the fact that the prison is ultimately a closed institution. It's there to keep prisoners in, but it's also there. We can't see what's going on behind it. Um, so um, I've forgotten your question again, sorry. It, it's really, <laughs> I, we I was interested in the jurisdictions that, you know, the yeah. other jurisdictions and, and then the, the learnings from the Irish context. Yeah, so I think fair procedures matter. Um, what, to what extent they, they will have an impact in an Irish context remains to be seen, but fair procedures matter. That's, the, I think, the main take home. Yeah, great. Uh, there have been three very stimulating papers on the sort of criminal justice theme, and, and as it's as is clear to you, I hope, um, WIT is, is really the leading uh, leading the charge nationally in criminal justice research and uh, I, I'm happy to, to also say that we're working closely with the Irish Prison Service on designing their training for, 
future prison officers. So uh, the research that the guys are doing is actually having a will have a real impact on the criminal justice system into the future. So I think that's that's a real tribute to the quality of the research and to the quality of the, the researchers both here and, and involved in the supervision. Our final uh, presenter is not in the criminal justice area. Um, I want, I'm very pleased to introduce Dana Killen, who's going to talk about uh, connecting diverse sectors to inspire innovative ways of reducing gender inequality in Irish cultural organisations. Um, and Dana is working with Dr. Una Keeley and uh, a, no, a number of other stakeholders, including the Abbey Theatre, the Arts Council and others, which is going to tell us all about that now. Dana. So uh, good morning. Uh, I began my PhD in September 2015 and was awarded a grant from the Waterford Institute of Technology Scholarship Fund. The Performing Women Project, which is my PhD research, focuses on exploring the relationship between women playwrights and the Abbey Theatre throughout the 20th century. Objective 8 is concerned with the development of gender policy in the Irish theatre sector, thus ensuring the project is not just historically reflective but very much engaged with changing the ways in which theatre researchers, practitioners and policy makers engaged with the changing, um, engage with and foster new theatre practice by women. My supervisor, Dr Una Keeley and I are currently in talks with the Arts Council regarding the publication of a public discussion document to consider how gender equality policy can be developed in the cultural sector. Today's paper will explore the type of information currently being prepared for inclusion in the discussion document. The document looks into areas and organisations outside of the cultural sector. This is to identify problematic areas and then to draw on the experiences of international organisations, thus inspiring innovative ways of applying universally recognised actions to the Irish theatre sector. This paper will now discuss some of the findings and subsequent actions. The United Nations Commission on the Status for Women was established in 1946 and arguably its most influential world conference is the 1995 Beijing Assembly that produced the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, now the key global document on gender policy development. Significantly, the declaration argues that the underrepresentation of women in decision-making positions in the areas of art and culture reinforces the tendency for political decision-making to remain the domain of men and hinders the advancement of women into equal participation in political, economic and social life. According then to this diagnosis, the development of policy that advocates the increased representation of women in powerful positions in the theatre sector has the potential to influence the development of gender equality in other sectors and thus lead the national conversation on gender equality. Because of the pervasiveness of gender inequality, the Beijing Declaration recommends gender mainstreaming, which is a consideration of implications for women and men at all levels of any planned action, whether seemingly related to gender or not, as the most effective way of generating equality. Similar policy that advocates the impl implementation of gender mainstreaming in the theatre sector will make strange supposedly natural processes, thus allowing them to be consciously assessed. The European Institute for Gender Equality also advocates gender mainstreaming, as well as the need to increase, increase awareness. To improve awareness, it has developed the Gender Equality Index. Uh, the index represents robust quantitative data gathered from all member states over the time period 2005 to 2012 and was designed to compare member states with each other and over time across six domains work, money, knowledge, time, power and health. These are collated into a single summary measure to give each country an index rating from 1 to 100 where one is complete gender inequality 
and 100 is complete gender equality. As we can see, Ireland's index rating is 56.5, which is slightly above the European average of 52.9, but still just over halfway to gender equality, while Sweden is the leader in the field with an index of 74.2. Uh, focusing on Ireland, we can see that gender inequality appears to be decreasing in most domains in the period of economic prosperity between 2005 and 2010, before levelling in subsequent recessionary times. Notably, however, the reverse is true in the domain of time, suggesting that although women became more equal in the domain of work, during the same time period, their role within the domestic, domestic sphere did not decrease accordingly. This paper suggests that, based on this index, the development of an index to measure gender equality across several domains within Irish cultural organisations would provide sound statistics and robust quantitative data. It would result in the classification of organisations dependent on their index rating, with public recognition for leaders in the field. Additionally, an organisation's progress could be measured over time, and this would allow the efficacy of any implemented policies to be assessed within an organisation. It is crucial that the index considers intersecting qualities such as age, class, race, ethnicity and disability status and as such extends equality awareness into areas other than gender. This approach seeks to acknowledge and share the value of all voices, attitudes and experiences and thus allows the impact of the work to be far-reaching in Irish society. To conclude then, Elaine Aston attributes the undoing of late 20th century Western feminism to the development of neoliberalism and the subsequent focus on the individual instead of the collective. This division of the collective has arguably prevented a collaborative move towards gender equality, and it has become clear then that this individual project can only be impactful if it is founded on collaboration and cooperation, which is why, in conjunction with my supervisory team in WIT, I am engaged in a number of projects. I am a founding, founder member of a working group of academics seeking to challenge the ways that female writers feature within the canon of Irish literature. I've participated in a transatlantic seminar and um, around Irish women's work, as well as two play readings. And I've presented a paper at the 2016 Irish Society for Theatre Research Conference. I've just finished co-curating an exhibition on Waterford playwright Teresa Devi and concluded the exhibition by delivering a public lecture on her work. Additionally, Dr. Una Keeley and I have been invited to present this research at the International Federation for Theatre Research to be held this June in Sweden, the European Centre of Progression in the area of gender equality, thus adding an international impact dimension to the research. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation. Could I ask you, with relation to the trends, is this part of your study that you created, that you studied the existing trends to create this model, or is it pre-existing by another author? No, th this is the, the European model by the European Institute for Gender Equality, but I'm looking at it as the idea for a model that could, it could be based on for Irish cultural institutions. So the, the idea is to create a discussion document that perhaps would suggest something like this to be transferred into the Irish theatre sector. And that's your research objective, is it? Uh, that's one of them, that's, yeah. Just for one quick question. Uh, I'm just fascinated by the, the various categories that they assess. Yes. Um, is there an equal weighting given to those? Or, you know, are they recognised as D6 to take in terms of assessment of equality, say for example, those six yeah. different domains? I think those were the, the six areas where they found to be the greatest inequality or division in each domain. And then they had a, a mathematical formula which they collated the, the information into to create a, a single summary measure. And that was the, the one before it. And then they, they do the breakdown in, in this chart here. 
But it's an equal weighting given to each of those yes, in the calculation. Yes, yeah, it is. Okay, thanks. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Damon, thank you very much. Okay. And, uh, and thank you and well done to, to all the presenters today. And I, I think hope they've given you a good flavour of what we're about in humanities. And it's, it's great stuff, so well done to all of them. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, and to all our presenters from the School of Humanities. Next up, we have our second instalment of the um, One Minute poster pitches. So we have the AHSS category, and our first student up is Alice Tan, if you'd like to join the stage, Alice. Good morning, everybody. My name is Alice. Uh, in my study, eTandem is an arrangement of two native speakers of different languages in separate locations, learn each other's language and culture. Uh, they communicate regularly with one another using electronic medium. In this eTandem exchange, uh, they are from uh, the participants are university students from Ireland, America, and China. They exchanged emails and used wiki spaces to uh, switch between Chinese and English. Um, the, this study aims to explore the impact of eTandem on the development of intercultural and language awareness. The data include emails, online foreign entries, learning diaries, and uh, questionnaires. This study, uh, from the qualitative and quantitative analysis, uh, indicates that although eTandem has great potential to, uh, uh, to promote participants' intercultural and language awareness, challenges such as how to maintain their motivation still exist. Okay, that's the overview of my research. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Burke. I'm a first year PhD student in the School of Business, and I'm currently six months into an inductive research project entitled the Exploring the Professional Identity of Accountants in Organizations. So emerging research has suggested that the role of the accountant has, has altered dramatically in line with the, 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 the informalization of work, and where accountants were once seen as the cost controllers and organization disciplinarians, they're now being co-opted into more mainstream managerial duties. So these changes are, I suppose, are not value, uh, value neutral, and they raise important questions, I suppose, but uh, the knock-on impact on the identity and self-identity of accountants in organizations. So the primary uh, contribution of the study for myself will be to discourse on the accounting profession. And in the long term, I hope to, to, make, to inform and, and uh, reform accounting body policy and uh, make a contribution to accounting education and training. And being a qualified accountant myself, I'm, I'm well versed in, in, in all those types of things. So in order to address the research issues, um, didn't think it would go, go that fast, but I'll I just, I just, just one little bit left. Um, I'm conducting a series of narrative interviews with professionally qualified accountants. So to date, I've got nine completed. And this will be coupled with an, et an ethnographic study of the accountants' identities and the environments in which they work in. Um, my poster is, no is number 50 up the right-hand side. So. I know I went over, so if people want to ask me a question, please pop out and do so during the break. Thanks. Hello, everybody. My name is Eva Marczuk. My research is about different accents of global English, in particular Polish-accented English in Ireland. So an accent is a silent marker of belonging to a particular culture. As some cultures can be perceived as the better and some as the worse. In relation to this, I've divided accents of English into three groups. The top group, the accents which are perceived as the most prestigious and culturally superior. A huge amount of people strive to speak those accents to belong to the top group. The second group, the accents which are perceived as less valuable than the top ones, but they very useful, uh, valuable in the countries where they are used, and third group, the accents which are perceived as incorrect with little value, and uh, speakers uh, of those accents are exposed to discrimination. So my research explores from one point of view the con concept of accent globalization, from the other the concept of cultural discrimination. More 
details, please see my poster. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kenny Doyle. I'm a second year PhD student. And my uh, project, as you can see, is called Assessing Ireland's Pathways to Work Policy, the Impact of Labour Market Activation and Sanctions. Pathways to Work was introduced in 2012 as an attempt to arrest spiralling rates of unemployment. And it's an active labour market policy which treats unemployed people as active job seekers and attaches strict conditions to the, wealth, or to the receipt of welfare payments. This means that anyone in receipt of payments is now compelled to attend one-on-one -on -one meetings with the caseworker, uh, sign a social contract which outlines a range of measures uh, which they must undertake uh, in order to bring them back to the labour market. These measures include going to training, doing internships or job placements, or even committing to predefined numbers of job applications per week. And failure to comply with these measures can mean that sanctions in the form of a reduction or a cessation of payments, which makes social welfare under Pathways strictly conditional. So the study I'm doing is to look at the operation of Pathways to Work by conducting in-depth and repeat interviews with the people involved in Pathways. So that's both the people receiving the payments and those subject to the new rules. Um, so it's the people who are claiming and the people who are operating the system. So I'm hoping also to speak to uh, various people in the Department of Social Welfare Office and so on. Uh, I'm poster 11, so come and have a chat with me, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm looking at Enda Kenny's apology speech to the Magdalene women. Um, effective state apologies can be powerful tools to promote reconciliation, especially after historic abuses. And God knows we've had a lot of those in Ireland over the years. Um, now, effective state apologies can mark a new beginning for survivors, but also for countries as a whole. And however, if the apologies are seen as self-serving or insincere, they can not only cause distress to the victims, they can also damage intergroup relations. In 2013, Taoiseach Enda Kenny made a very emotional, long overdue apology to the Magdalene women, and he received an extraordinary amount of media coverage after this. And he's also having his apology referenced in media articles to date after more than three years. Um, he received both negative and positive co uh, um, coverage, and my research involves a content analysis of the online and print media articles, um, and also I'm looking at a content analysis of the social media coverage because he made the apology on behalf of the women, uh, sorry, on behalf of society as well as the state, and now my time is up, so please come and see poster 16. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. The aim of my research is to develop a knowledge framework that maximises the potential of senior tourism. 2015 was a record year for Irish tourism, but demand is mainly concentrated in the high season and within the larger urban centres, which are approaching peak capacity. One untapped revenue stream that has the capability to alleviate these problems is the niche senior tourism market. However, tourism products in general exhibit a bias. Whilst tourists are ageing, current offerings are typically designed with the average person in mind, leading to the exclusion of the senior tourist potential. My research proposes to utilise a dynamic capabilities lens. This will aid the creation of a practical knowledge framework for Irish culture and heritage microfirms which dominate the landscape. The research will also contribute to advancing knowledge in the field of senior tourism innovation, seasonality and microtourism. Thank you. Consider the stock exchange functions as the Colosseum in Rome. Consider financial analysts to be gladiators, financial institutions the lions and tigers, speculators the spectators, and the investor, Caesar. <laughs> Consider he who avails of an inside advantage to possibly beat the market or to be saved by the thumb of Caesar. Whilst all roads lead to Rome, the aim of this study is threefold. To evaluate, if one, the adoption of the Market Abuse Directive in 2003 
mitigated analysts' potential conflicts of interest, two, enhanced transparency, and three, ensured equality for all market participants in Ireland, Germany, and the UK. When investors were at their most vulnerable, when investors were at the greatest risk of being mauled by the lions and tigers. Morning, everyone. My own project, as the slide shows, is on institutional racism, a phrase which was coined in 1967 America by Stanley Carmichael and Charles V. Hamilton. Since then, vast amounts of research have been done, but in Ireland it is considerably under-researched, with three articles that I, can, that I can think of from 2007, 2010, and 2013. For my own research, I aim to investigate institutional racism within the Irish workplaces through a mixed methods approach. Firstly, a systematic chronological review of legal cases heard over 15 years from one of the branches of the Irish legal system, followed by a number of semi-structured interviews with participants from the legal system itself. Uh, these two investigative pieces, along with a literature review, uh, is intended to create a picture of institutional racism within Ireland to see how prevalent it is and to evaluate the legislation. For anyone who wants to question me on it, poster 15 outside. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. By 2025, it's expected that the numbers of students entering higher education in Ireland will have increased by 50%. And the bulk of this increase will be in adult learners, Adult learners, like many of us, have different needs from traditional learners. Their home, work and family commitments mean that education is often their fourth priority. So the chance to participate flexibly in education is an absolute must. Now technology can provide a bridge between the needs of the learners, the needs for flexibility and the needs of the sector. But often flexibility through technology is considered to be simply distance learning. Distance is only one of 26 different dimensions of flexibility that exist in education. My aim is to use a mixed methods approach to develop a model for flexible learning through technology. The model will support practitioners, aid the sector in preparing for its expansion. My poster is number 29 and it presents my conceptual framework. And if you'd like to know more about the topic or the flexibility dimensions, please come and talk to me at number 29. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ty Plarmida. I'm a fourth year PhD researcher with RICON, and I'm here to talk about my project with the objective of helping organizations to rapidly diagnose deficient areas of their service innovation performance and inform targeted improvements. Now, currently, there's no mechanism beyond generic tools, either in industry or academia, that helps organizations to understand where best to direct their resources and energies for effective service innovation. So in order to overcome these ineffectual appraisals, we've dimensionalized service innovation capability and tracked its uh, dimensions um, across five synthesized maturity levels. By merging an understanding of the maturity model framework with key components of service innovation capability, it was possible for us to create a service innovation capability maturity model um, which can measure the extent to which capabilities are present in organizations and identify elements where they're strong or weak. Currently, scales are being developed to quantitatively uh, measure their presence, and we anticipate the project to have a value by enhancing the literature in addition to its translational value in industry. Thank you.
seem to be missing our final presenter there. Um, so I'd like to invite you all out now to the atrium to have a cup of tea or coffee. And um, we'd encourage you to take the opportunity to discuss the posters with all of our researchers out there and also to look at our image competition, which is in the main section by the coffee. You've gotten your voting slips within your um, book of abstracts and we would love if you would um, participate in our competition by voting before lunchtime. We'd look for everyone to be back here at 20 to 12. Thank you.